turn to the Lord in prayer together. Lord Jesus, we want to see your glory this morning. We want to, as those who are about to read about, stand in astonishment at your works, to be amazed at your goodness. Holy Spirit, help us hear and receive afresh through your word this testimony to your power, your authority, and your goodness. May it be for your glory and for our good. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> so in our culture, there's an increasing distrust and even rejection of authority. Some of this, we might say, is a generational thing, but I think collectively, society-wide, we have this increasing distrust of authority in our institutions. The polls keep saying how much... Uh, trust in institutions has declined, whether the government or corporations or the church, those things which were in, in some days more trusted, more looked to as authoritative. And I think in our society, rightly so, in many ways, we've seen how authority has been abused. We've seen how authority has been misused. We've seen how authority has corrupted otherwise well-meaning people. It was Lord Acton who said, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And there's some truth in that because we're full of sin. Because we humans are sinful. We are corruptible. And authority is something that has the tendency to be misused, abused, to corrupt us. So when we think about the authority of Jesus Christ, we sometimes find ourselves projecting these cultural notions of authority onto our Lord, implicitly or explicitly, whether we mean to or not. Sometimes we look at his authority and question, should I really trust that? Do I really need to obey that? And in our society, too, in all of us, the, the waters that we swim in growing up and, and the formation that's so impacted our souls, our society, the, the, where authority is located is in us. That I am the ultimate authority over my life. I am the one who gets to decide who I am, what I do, where I go, what I say. I am the authority. And no matter how long we've been trying to follow Jesus and proclaiming him Lord, it is hard to proclaim him Lord when we see ourselves as the ultimate authority. So Jesus' authority is different than what we've known before. Fundamentally, categorically different than what we see authority being in our culture. Because his authority is rooted in his goodness and his love. His authority is without sin. This is the one that Moses spoke of in our Old Testament lesson. Telling the people that God would raise up another prophet like him. That he would speak the very words of God. That the people should listen to him and obey him. And Jesus is that prophet. But Jesus is so much more than Moses was. In that season of the life of Israel, Moses' authority was absolute. He was the emissary of God. He spoke on behalf of God. The people had to obey him. Uh, and Jesus not only has the authority to lead, to command like Moses, but he has the authority over all reality. To speak the truth that transforms us and to bring us into salvation. Jesus is the one who shows us what true authority really is. So as we look to our gospel lesson in Mark chapter 1, and I do want to encourage you to open your Bibles with me to Mark chapter 1, starting verse 21, we see that Mark is highlighting the character of Jesus' ministry early on. This first chapter is Mark's introduction to the person of Jesus. We've seen in the last several weeks that Jesus, his 
Jesus' baptism, his calling of the first disciples. And now we see Mark showing us in this one scene what we should expect of the ministry of this man, Jesus. This scene is a bit of a microcosm, a, an exemplar of the ministry of Jesus. Mark's highlighting for us the character of his ministry and what we can expect. And so there are many ways we can explore the ministry of Jesus through this passage, but as I already said, the one thing I want to highlight this morning is his authority. Twice in this passage, the word authority is used to describe Jesus' ministry. The Greek word is exousia, authority, exousia. Ex is that prefix meaning out of, and ousia is that word means substance. If you know your theology and your history, the homoousia is the of same substance that Jesus is with God, that Jesus is God because he has that same substance. And so his authority comes out of the substance, the reality of who he is. His authority is the power that is authoritative to shut down all lies because it is truth. It is substantive. It is powerful. He carries this authority in his words and his deeds and in his very person. And the response of the people is amazement, astonishment, we're told. That he's so different than the scribes. This is real authority. Even the unclean spirits obey him. They're amazed and they're astonished and so should we be. That's my prayer for us, that we would be astonished anew at the power of Jesus, the authority that he bears for us. So I want to look together at the authority of Jesus in our lives through this passage, his authority to teach and his authority to save. So we see, starting with our passage, the authority to teach. That Jesus starts off his ministry by going into the synagogue on the Sabbath and teaching there. And the word says, and they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. The scribes were the PhDs in theology of the day. They were the respected teachers that everyone looked to, saying, saying give us a word from God. Tell us what the word of God means. They were the ones who, who gave the authoritative interpretation of God's word. But Jesus is not giving an interpretation of God's word. He is giving God's word. And there's a fundamental and noticeable difference between them. Jesus is not building off the rabbinical tradition that the scribes are teaching from. Their authority is derived from a long chain of rabbinical traditions that are rooted in God's word, in the old covenants. Their authority is being used to teach about that word. It is derived authority. Jesus' authority is not derived. Any teacher of the word is, using, is speaking from derived authority, secondary authority. Jesus himself is the word. He is the uh, it, it was the authority of his word at the beginning that brought all things into being. He's not just teaching us the truth. He is the truth. He's the substance of reality that holds all things together. And the people are realizing they haven't known what true authority is until they hear the words of Jesus. So because he is the truth, that means that what he teaches is the truth. What he teaches must be the truth, can be nothing less than the truth. And there's no question here that Jesus' words are truth. There is no lie in them. There's no working around this. And sometimes I think we try to do these incredible feats of mental gymnastics to try to get around the authoritative teachings of Jesus, to try to get around the authority of the word of God. But Jesus' words are true authority. They're revealing truth and reality to us, and they are to be obeyed. 
His word is all authority. And when I say his word, I'm not just talking about the red letters in your Bible. All of God's word is authoritative. Jesus is the word that inspired the written word. That is, it's come to us as the word of God to teach us, to save us, to form us. And all that God wanted to communicate to us is there in his word. And that's not something separate from the words of Jesus. They're all the word of God together. Scripture is our ultimate authority. The Reformation principle of sola scriptura recovered for us the idea that Scripture is the word of God, and it has the final say over our lives and over doctrine, and it is truth. Sola scriptura doesn't mean that Scripture is the only source of authority, but that it is the final source of authority. It is the ultimate source of authority. And so our call is to obey the word of God and to be faithful to it in all things, even when we don't like it. Because the one who spoke creation into being does have the right to tell us what we should do with our bodies. He has the right to tell us what we should do with our money. He has the right to tell us what it means to be human. How we relate to our enemies. How we care for the poor and the outcast. How we relate to brothers and sisters in the church. The one whose authority brought all creation into being has the authority to teach us these things. And to be obeyed. The word of God has that authority, we do not. And so we are a people who are called to follow his word, to obey his word, always and without compromise, without explaining away, without trying to do mental gymnastics when the word of God doesn't align with how I think the universe should operate. One of our colleagues in the season of Advent uh, famously Ask the Lord to bless us as we hear, read, learn, mark, and inwardly digest the word of God in Scripture. And when we hear, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest the word of God, we are encountering Jesus' authority in his word. That's why I want to always encourage us and exhort us to read our Bibles every day. Don't let a day go by when you're not submitting yourself to the ultimate authority through the word of God. Don't let a day go by when you are not seeking to align yourself with the truth of the universe, with the reality of who God is and who he's made you to be, with the call of how he is sending you into this world. Don't let a day go by without letting your hearts and minds be formed with the word of God. Jesus has the authority to teach. And we honor that through our obedience to it. He also uh, proclaims in this passage that he has the authority to save. At the conclusion of his teaching, an unclean spirit, a man with an unclean spirit, enters the synagogue. A demon-possessed man comes into church. And yes, even in the synagogue, even in church, demons can enter. Demons can have their way, can wreak havoc. They're usually in the choir, right? <laughs> Not in this church, though. Not in this church. Praise God. So Mark refers to this demon as an unclean spirit, that, uh, that pollution, that contamination of a spirit that which... In, in Jewish concepts of holiness, what was unclean could not enter into the purity of God, could not enter into the presence of God, which is, which is clean and pure. So this demon knows Jesus. He has some insight into the spiritual realm that the people around him do not, and he identifies him. He says, I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. Why does he say this? Some, some scholars say that in the ancient world, there was this belief that 
to speak the name of, of a spiritual foe was to gain mastery over it. To identify someone was to, to lay claim to them, to, to claim mastery over them. So this demon sees what is true about Jesus, sees who he is more than what people around him can see, and he identifies him, calls him out, not to proclaim his, the good news, not to worship him, but to declare him an enemy, to try to go to war with Jesus. You're the Holy One of God. And the implication is, I'm against you. The demon asks Jesus, have you come to destroy us? That us, maybe he's talking about all the demonic realm, maybe he's talking in the first person plural, we don't know, but the question, have you come to destroy us, is put to Jesus. And the answer, of course, is yes. Yes, Jesus has come to cast out demons. He has come to bind the work of Satan. That's his ministry. It's a sign to us of something that we don't often acknowledge or don't want to acknowledge, that we are always in the midst of a spiritual battlefield. That there's this cosmic war going on around us. That the coming of Jesus into this world was an invasion into enemy-occupied territory where he's coming to claim this world for himself again. But Jesus has come to destroy the works of the devil, to crush the serpent's head. As we proclaim in our Eucharist liturgy that through the cross and the resurrection, he has trampled hell and Satan under his feet. This is his ministry, to destroy the works of the devil. Have you come to destroy us, Jesus? Absolutely. Absolutely. Jesus says to him, be silent. The Greek word is like, be muzzled. He's telling this demon, shut up. Stop talking. Cease your lies. Be muzzled. Jesus has the authority, the power, to shut up the voice of the demonic in our lives. So whenever we encounter temptation. Let me encourage you to ask Jesus to tell Satan to shut up and go to hell. Jesus has the power to shut Satan's mouth, to stop his lies. And when we encounter the lies of Satan in our world, in our lives, in our hearts, temptations that speak to us, ask Jesus to shut him up. Always a great prayer to pray. And fun to say. Be silent and come out of him, Jesus says. When Jesus says, come out, the demon must obey. He must submit to the authority and the power of Jesus. And by doing this, Jesus is bringing freedom to this man who is bound and possessed and overwhelmed by the work of Satan, bringing salvation to his life through this healing. So I think Mark's showing us here that this exorcism was a microcosm of Jesus' ministry to bring war upon the devil and all his works. He's using his authority to save us, to heal us, to bring us into a deeper freedom, to bring us into a deeper wholeness. So here's the point that I think Mark is making for us. That all of Jesus' ministry, everything he does, everything he's here for, is an exercise of his authority. His authority is to love. His authority is to heal, to transform, to save. His authority is to conquer Satan and death itself. So how does it feel, church, to know that Jesus puts all the weight of his authority into blessing you, into saving you? 
The Gospel of John, chapter 13, tells us that Jesus used his authority. Knowing that the Father had put all things into his hands, he used his authority to do what? To wash the feet of his disciples. The authority of Jesus is revealed through his humility, through his service, through his sacrifice. Ultimately, his authority is most clearly revealed to us on the cross, where he shed his blood, his body broken, to crush the serpent's head. His authority is an expression of his love for you. His authority is for you. Because ultimately, the, the same authority that brought all of creation into being by saying, let there be light, and there was, is the same one who speaks his authority over you and declares, your sins are forgiven. You are free. You are beloved. Do you hear the authority of Jesus in these words spoken over you? How can they not be true? How can they not define all that we are? How can we not submit to his authority when he speaks this over us? When we call Jesus Lord, we are placing ourselves under his authority. And when we call Jesus Lord, when we submit ourselves to him, we are not submitting ourselves to a tyrant or to a king or a president or a boss who can be corrupted by power or who doesn't like you and who wants to use his authority to, to undermine you, to, to be cruel, to punish you. We're not submitting ourselves to a tyrant. We're submitting ourselves to the only one who is truly good, who is love itself, who only ever uses his authority to bless you, to save you. He is incorruptible. He is without sin. And all of our notions of authority that are so tainted by sin, we can throw those out because Jesus is categorically different and the authority that he bears, and how he wields it. His authority is always grounded in love and goodness. Grounded in himself. So when Jesus rebukes you, it's because he loves you and desires to bless you. When Jesus calls you to confess your sin and repent, it's because he's longing to bring you into life and to free you from the way of death. And for many of us, this is still hard. It's still a battle to submit ourselves, to confess that Jesus is Lord and surrender our right to be Lord, to surrender the lordship, the mastery we have in our own lives, and to call him master. And sometimes, perhaps, we still fear that authority. And maybe, like the demons, we're asking of Jesus, are you going to destroy me, Jesus? if I submit to you? Have you come to destroy us? And the answer, of course, is yes. Because the authority of Jesus to heal, to teach, to save you, is going to crucify you. It's going to crucify the flesh in you, the sin in you. And the only reason that's not terrifying is because of who he is. Because we learn to trust in his goodness. We learn to surrender to his love poured out for us. And we also come to learn to recognize that there are parts of me that need to be destroyed. There are parts of me that need to die. Surrender to Jesus as Lord is a death. 
It is a destruction of the flesh in us, a destruction of the power of Satan over us. It is a death, and it is a resurrection. There is a deep grace in letting Jesus wreck your life and bring you into his abundance, his eternal life. The authority of Jesus Christ is longing to bless you, to love you, to save you, to make out of you a saint. That's what he's after. Bringing you into eternity, making you someone who is holy, who is incorruptible from the world, the flesh, and the devil as he is. This is the authority that he used to wash feet. The authority that he wielded going to the cross. The authority to save you and to bless you. And you can trust in him. Surrender to him. Call upon him as your Lord anew today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are for us and not against us. If you were against us, we could not stand. But with you for us, what can stand against us? That in your power, in your authority, we, having been brought to death and into new life with you, have become more than conquerors. And there is nothing that can ever separate us from you, Lord. And so we bless you. And by your grace, we surrender to you. We submit to you and say that you are the Lord. You are the master. You call all the shots. We yield any right that we might have thought we had to you. And because you are good, we can do so with joy, with love, with hope for the abundance that you pour out upon us. So go with us, Lord. Give us grace each and every day to submit ourselves and to call you our Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen.